it's level. Can you hear it? Good. Okay. Ready to go. Good evening, everyone, to the library at the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. My name is Misha Glenny, and I'm the rector um, of the Institute. We have a very special uh, evening uh, tonight. I am extremely honored and privileged to introduce two of the most uh, acute commentators uh, both on Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and the whole world um, with us today, which is just as well because the topic is going to be the Russo-Ukrainian War and the future of the world. Uh, we're being live-streamed, and I imagine we've got a lot of people listening in to this to hear the Professor of History at Yale, Timothy Snyder, author of Bloodlands, amongst uh, many other books, uh, who has become the most articulate defender of Ukraine in these very difficult times, and his reputation spans the world, as does that of his interlocutor, Ivan Krastev, who is the founder of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, and like Timothy, is a permanent fellow here at the IWM. Um, I am going to start off by asking Timothy a question. Uh, they will talk probably for about an hour and ten minutes or so because while well, we have the benefit of the two of them here together, I want to get as much out of them as possible. There will be a uh, time for questions and answers uh, at the end. But first we're going to concentrate on our two guests. And the question really asks itself, the first question. Uh, Tim has written today uh, a very clear, coherent piece on his substack about uh, what the events over the weekend in Rostov, Varonish, and Moscow uh, amount to. And so I think I'm going to start by asking Tim if he can, because not all of us will have read the Substack piece, can give us a precy of where we stand after this bizarre, extraordinary weekend. Right. Well, first of all, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, thanks to those of you who are here virtually. Thanks to the staff at IVOM for preparing all of, all of this. I was in this room not very long ago, and it was set up for a conference, and now it's set up so we can all be here. And I just want to say thank you for that. I think, I mean, grosso modo, Misha, what we are seeing all the color and all the surprise and, and all the tawdriness that we're seeing the last two or three days, although unpredictable at the micro level, I think in a way is very predictable at the macro level. That is to say, it's not surprising overall that an aging dictatorship engaged in not just, a, 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 not just an atrocious, but a counterproductive war is going to start to face challenges at home. And I think it's very important for us as this process continues, as it will, not to be shocked and surprised every time something like this comes down the line. It's normal and to be expected that things like this are going to come down the line. Um, with respect to, to, to Prigozhin and these events in particular, uh, it's, it's, I think, also important to recognize that in fascism, the tawdry and the deadly serious go hand in hand. So as I'm, I'm watching Ukrainian reactions to these events in Russia, sometimes you, hear, you, you read Ukrainians say, let's just step back and appreciate how hilarious this is. And they have a point. There is something very funny about Russians attacking Russia. There's something very funny about the fact that Wagner took a year to cover two kilometers in Ukraine and took, you know, a minute to cover 200 kilometers in Russia, right? Th that is inherently funny. Even as it's funny, 
just like Italian fascism could be funny or Romanian fascism could be funny, it's also deadly serious. The, the, the two men who are in competition are responsible um, jointly for horrendous war crimes. And the political variety that is on, and this is my last point, the political variety that is on offer in Russia in this coup is, is both real and a bit disturbing because the political, in, in my view, and others don't have to accept these terms, but in, in my view, you are seeing two rival versions of fascism, which is a political spectrum of sorts and not an unfamiliar one. If you were a student of, say, Romania in the late 1930s, it's not an unknown political spectrum, but it is a concerning political spectrum. And it brings, it brings to my mind one of the things, and this will not seem connected, but, ho ho but, but bear with me, it, it brings to my mind one, one of the worst things I think that Putin has done in Russia, which is to deny Russia a political future. What should have happened during this coup attempt, but didn't happen, was that people would protest the general situation, right? If you think back to August of 1991, the coup attempt of August 19th, 1991, people went on the streets, not so much to support Gorbachev, not even necessarily to support Yeltsin, but to protest the general situation of a reactionary coup attempt. The people in Russia who would be protesting the general situation or who might have some idea of the future of Russia are generally in exile and they're in prison. And that's a conscious policy of the Putin regime. And for me, it's that, that absence during this coup is very interesting. It, there's an absence of people who support Putin. That's very noteworthy, right? Who was on the streets in Rostov carrying a sign saying, I support Vladimir Putin? As far as I know, nobody. And that's very interesting because it raises the lid on something which people in the West tend to, tend to assume, which is that Putin is popular. I think he's not, personally. I think it's a matter of not having an alternative. And as soon as an alternative appears, you realize that there is euphoria, there is euphoria about the possibility of any change, or perhaps even more interesting, there's a willingness to accept whatever comes down the line, right? So the, re the, 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 the lack of a reaction or the euphoric reaction to this incredible chain of events is interesting, but it's also, and, and it shows us that Putin himself doesn't have support in, at least in the Western sense of the word, right? As soon as an alternative appears, he doesn't seem to have support. But it's also very problematic for Russia's future that there weren't people who were out there supporting something else. <laughs> And it's that absence of something else which I, which I find very concerning. Ivan, what's your take on it? Mr. Prigozhin started as a chef. So from this point of view, he knows what it means to be cooked. Uh, and as a result of it, I do believe this is quite important. He basically realized that in the next two weeks, he's going to be cooked. That basically Wagner is going to be dismantled his fate is going to be decided by his enemies. And then he decided to ask for the meeting with the president. And the easiest way to go for a meeting with the president is to go with some other people yeah. uh, to Moscow. Uh, and the story is that the president so much didn't want to talk to him that he asked another president, <laughs> Lukashenko, to talk. It. No, no, but thi this is in a certain way. And uh, uh, in this uh, piece that uh, Tim wrote, the sentence that I like most is that he said often, uh, their plots without a coup, and now we have a coup without a plot. Uh, because it was a strategy of negotiating. And uh, what struck me is that when you see the nature of the Russian forces, uh, you're seeing the medieval nature, basically, of the army. You have the army of the Tsar, the regular army, and then you have the private armies. You have the Wagner group, but also you have the Chechens of Mr. Kadyrov. But then, basically, probably you don't know, but there are three other private formations. Uh, and then basically the problem is where the loyalty of these people go. The most interesting story was that 5,000 people went with uh, Mr. Prigozhin into this enterprise. He didn't know what to do in Moscow because he was there to meet the president. Uh, and uh, as a result of it, we have a 24 days of negotiations. And listen, I have all my understanding of the situation comes from watching 
hundreds of Russian police movies, which my wife can confirm. Uh, and one thing that you basically get on this is that uh, people were also not on the streets because they didn't know what is going on. Uh, normally in the Russian police movie, there are three things that are critically important. If you only listen and you don't watch, you're never going to distinguish when the policeman speaks and when a criminal speaks. They share language. Secondly, physically they don't look very different in the way they're dressed and so on. But thirdly, uh, all kind of investigation is the clash between department of the one department of the police and another department of the police. So from this point of view, you don't know what is happening. You don't know who is negotiating with whom. Uh, and this is one of the things that happened, and this goes to the way that the Russian population does not feel included in the game. They don't know what this is about. You're going to support Putin, and then basically it appears that Putin is going to come and miss Mr. Prigozhin, and you're going to look like an idiot. So from this point of view, this is not this type of a polarization. But uh, the, the result of it, I do believe three things came out of this, and they're much more interesting than basically what Mr. Prigozhin did. The first is, was the Western reaction. And the Western reaction was, as we know, uh, basically in order to put insult to the humiliation, uh, the American intelligence services uh, reported that 24 hours earlier, they have been basically briefed their leadership that they're going to be a coup in Russia. If a Russian president basically believing that the American Congress, even not the president, the congressional leadership was briefed. Uh, but it was uh, uh, very clear that for the West, anybody is going to be better than Putin, which is a major change. This was not going to be like this. And do you know why? For, in my view, very legitimate reason. It's enough to listen what Prigozhin said. He accuses for not winning the war, but also for starting the war. Uh, people realize that any other leader, regardless of how fascist, cruel, and so on he is, for him it's going to be easier to stop the war. Because he didn't start it. Because he can blame it on Putin. Because he can do this and that. Listen, this is a major change in the Western position. The second thing that, in my view at least, was critically important is that if you're going to ask me in which room I wanted to be when the, all this story started, I wanted to be in the room of the leader of Mali, the African Republic, which basically all the security is overtaken by Wagner people. Because then, before you believe that you're protected by Wagner and Russia, and then suddenly you understand that Wagner went against the Russian leadership. So one of the the story that we saw is that Mr. Shoigu decided to nationalize the private company, Wagner. But this private company has foreign assets. And obviously, they have a control of their foreign assets. And this is why uh, Mr. Prigozhin, at least theoretically, now is in Belarus. Uh, I, I'm saying this because the moment you're basically going to destroy him, all the Russia policy in Africa is in question. We don't know where is the loyalty of these people. And this goes to my last point, and this is that for the first time during this war, we saw the collective Putin. Normally, the idea was that there was a guy, and we have been speculating. And it's easy to speculate because not many people have been seeing him recently. Uh, but suddenly, during these 24 hours, there was a collective Putin, and even Lukashenko was part of it. Uh, in a certain way, there was not one person. This one person went on television and he said, I'm going severely to punish the people who are starting. He talked about treason, he talked about betrayal, he talked about civil war. And then suddenly, you have a deal in the way you have a business deals. Obviously, this is not because psychologically something happened. Obviously, there are other people that have been talking all the time to the presidents and trying to say this and that. Uh, I'm saying this because for me this was very interesting. You have Wagner started uh, their enterprise, let's put it like this, and then you see everybody who is ready to negotiate and nobody who is ready to fight. Paradoxically, the Russian elite remained consolidated. Not a single person of the elite sided with Wagner, but also not a single person decided basically to go to arrest Wagner. And this collective Putin, in my view, is a new reality. Uh, I don't know for how long this is going to do. Uh, but at this moment, you don't want to be on the uh, position of the Russian president, because anything that he's going to do is going to look a weakness. If he's going to keep Mr. Shoigu and basically Mr. Gerasimov, 
it is a weakness. If he's going to remove them, this is as if basically uh, uh, Prigozhin has done it. And I'm saying this because I'm ending. When uh, President Putin feels very weak, uh, he tries to do something very spectacular. He's doubling down. He's trying to show strengths, and particularly military strengths. So I'm very much interested in this situation, what he's going to do, particularly in a moment in which any weakness on the front, anything that the Ukrainians are going to achieve in the next week, is going to have a much higher cost than it was going to have uh, three days ago. On some of Ivan's points, and I particularly I want to stress right at the beginning something that Ivan sort of dropped as an aside, which is a, a very precious moment, and that is when a Russian leader tells the truth. So we have to we have to seize and we have to snatch and we and we have to emphasize those moments uh, because they are few and far between. The the moment when Prigozhin told the truth about what the war is actually about strikes me as being incredibly important, not because it's insightful, but actually because it's so obvious. And we've spent so much time as the so-called collective West debating the ridiculous motivations which Putin put out from this for this war, which range from the completely implausible to the outright contradictory, right? Whereas what Prigozhin said, which is very plausible, and entirely consistent with the Russian state in its actual form, as opposed to the form in which we are encouraged to imagine it. What he said was, this war was about a power grab over Ukraine in which we had our candidate to be president of Ukraine, a fellow called Medvedchuk, of whom some of you will have heard, and we intended to strip Ukraine of its assets and divide them up among our elite. That is very, very plausible. Um, it, it meets the test of Occam's razor. It's exactly what you would expect. It's not interesting the way that Western journalists or editors might want things to be interesting. It's not as interesting as debating whether or not, you know, who's the Nazi and, you know, all this nonsense which Putin has put in front of us. But it's, it has the ring of truth. And as Ivan says, Prigozhin is in uniquely in a position to say these things because more than anyone else in the Russian elite, um, in, which is a big statement, he is, can say, I'm the one who was in Ukraine. I'm the one who won the only battle in 2023. You know, if you want to call Bakhmut a victory, I'm the only one who won a battle, right? So he can, he's, he's in a position to speak truth, and he did at least for five seconds. And we need to treasure those five seconds. We need to keep those five seconds in mind because it can, it, knowing the simple truth about this war can, can release a lot of the anxiety that I think we've, uh, we otherwise feel when we discuss the, 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 no, the nonsense. This, the second thing which I wanted to add to what Yvonne said is that I, I agree that this was a kind of, I mean, it may have sounded like Yvonne was joking, but I, I think it's simply true that this was a bargaining strategy. You know, if you think of the Russian Federation as one big protection racket, the problem with a protection racket is that someone else can come in and say, I'm going to have a protection racket inside your protection racket. I'm going to take my, I'm going to come to Moscow, you know, and I'm going to bring my protection racket with me. And if you want me to stop, you have to offer me something, which is why it's my strong suspicion that whatever this deal contained, it probably contained a good deal of money. Um, I, I'd be very surprised if this didn't involve Prigozhin being paid off in some, in some meaningful way. Um, the third thing I wanted to add is that this is a situation in which everyone is humiliated. There are situations in which there are no winners and, which, and in which everyone is humiliated. You know, so for example, let's imagine you're in a relationship and should I not use this analogy? Let's imagine, <laughs> let's, let's imagine that you, let's, let's imagine that you're in a relationship and your best friend is about to move in on your relationship, but another friend tells you about it and you stop it by paying your best friend a million dollars. Now, in this situation, everyone is humiliated, right? You're humiliated but your best friend is humiliated, and the person with whom you're in a relationship is also humiliated because basically you've said like, okay, I'm gonna pay money you know, for you. That is roughly the situation in which everybody finds themselves. 
now, right? Because Putin won without winning. Prigozhin lost without losing, right? Um, Lukashenko weirdly comes in from the side, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the role of best friend or as the second best friend. It's a very strange situation, but at the end of it, everyone has, including Russia, right, who's obviously the person with whom you're in a relationship in my tortured analogy here, Russia is also humiliated by this. It's humiliating to have a leader bargain with another leader like this, to say, first, I'll do everything to protect your honor, and then eight hours later to say, oh, by the way, I'll make a deal about your honor, right? That is humiliating for everyone concerned. So everyone loses, not just in terms of Russia looking weaker, but also in the currency, which matters a lot, I believe, which is the currency of self-respect um, and the currency of respecting one another. I think a lot of that has gone down the drain. Misha, if you're going to give me just one minute on Prigozhin. Oh, of course. Because Prigozhin is an interesting character. And by the way, he could have been more interesting than what we saw in the last 24 hours. And I'm going to start with uh, some uh, sociology that I found quite important. Uh, like in the United States, Russian prison population is very high. So the number of the Russians that have been serving in the last decades in prison is higher than the numbers who had international passports. Uh, so we're talking about the big constituency. And listen, this is different people. Also, unlike in the United States, where basically you're going to end up with black uh, males and others, in Russia you're going to see a lot of business people there, a lot of people for uh, different reasons, because going through prison is the way to also redistribute property in the country in a big way. Why I'm saying this, when Prigozhin entered the politics, he made a major bet. His idea was all those who left Russia they're not part of the nation. What we should do is reintegrate those, all these ex-prisoners that can come and that they can prove that they're the real Russians. And listen, he was insisting that all these people who are going to serve for six months, if they remain alive, uh, can go for free in the universities. So there, was, there is a social revolution in every war, and he tried to, to take the position of an anti-elite, Putinism. This was Putin's ally who said, these oligarchs, they're stealing, they're doing this and that. But do you know where is the problem? And when it started, some colleagues said, it's 1917 again. But he didn't promise people land. And he didn't promise them peace. When he was talking about justice, this was the justice exactly in the sense you talk justice in the police films that I'm watching, which means that one member was not giving the share that he deserves. He said, my people have been dying in Bakhmut. My people have been disproportionately killed. And everything goes for Shoigu and Gerasimov. I'm saying this because this is very difficult. In order to have a coup, when that you have a revolution, you should have message to the people. There was no message to the people. And by the way, this is why there is no people in all this. Uh, there was humanitarian agents who were giving water and so on, and when asked uh, a woman on television, why are you giving to Wagner soldiers water? She said, out of curiosity and kindness. <laughs> uh, I'm saying all this because this is part of the story that people don't understand. And this is quite important because one of the things that has really dramatically changed, and this is my last point on this, uh, in the division between criminal world and kind of a normal world in Russia, you have two different ethics. And I know that there are people who know here Russia much better than me, but normally in the normal world, at least it should be like this, you're living according to the laws. In the criminal world, you're living papanyatium, <laughs> according to the concepts. This is very Platonian world, by the way. Everybody has the idea of justice in themselves. So the idea is what is just and unjust. And basically, Prigozhin went and said, what Gerasimov uh, <laughs> and Shoigu are doing to me is unjust. But this is the idea of the justice of the criminal community. Mm -hmm. In a certain way, it does not go beyond this. Uh, and I do believe this is the story why, uh, basically, you cannot have anybody on the street. And this is why, basically, there is no street and there is no people. So, uh, and this is not for the first time that they have this. If you remember the last uh, sentence in Boris Godunov, the people were silent. It's and also, sorry, I'm just, can I, can I go on, Misha? Sorry. Sure. <laughs> there's, the, there's, um, <sighs> There are a couple interesting things about this character that I want to add because I'm not sure this is all done and 
one of Prigozhin has used Putin's system against Putin. Absolutely. It's not an accident that he got as far as he did. So, you know, my understanding of the Putin system is that this is an essentially extractive regime in which social mobility is not really possible, and that is compensated for by a policy of propaganda spectacle where wars abroad in Syria and Ukraine are, so to speak, the raw material for the, the propaganda spectacle. Prigozhin got himself into the middle of this system and, and used it for himself, right? So the, the system depends upon a propaganda spectacle. What was Russia's only victory in 2023? It was Bakhmut. And Prigozhin took that for himself, right? So the whole Russian propaganda apparatus, which is supposed to be working for Putin, he'd managed to direct it towards himself, right? And then what about the military, which provides the spectacle? He spent all of his time trying to humiliate the actual leadership of the military, again, so that the spectacle would be his spectacle. So he spent months and months and months turning the entire Putin system to himself, right? With considerable success. It's gonna be harder for him now, but I think that, like, one underestimates his intelligence at one's peril. He's clearly a very intelligent person. And whenever I say anything like that, I should then feel like I should add he's also a war criminal a thousand times over and an atrocious human being. But he's very intelligent. And that's the second thing I wanted to add, which is hinted at in what Ivan says. Prigozhin compared, has, has Putin in a kind of class pincer operation because Putin sort of pretends to be a criminal. I mean, he, it, Okay, he is actually a criminal, but he pretends to be a criminal in the Russian sense. He sometimes uses the slang and so on. But he's never been to prison. Prigozhin has been to prison. He really is a former prisoner. And then Putin pretends to be someone who cares about Russian culture and speaks the language and so on. Prigozhin speaks much better Russian than Putin does. And you know his 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 mother runs an art gallery. He's he's he is actually coming from Russian high culture in a way that Putin is not. So he's got both of these notions of Russia better covered than Putin does. Um, I, I, that that seems to me to be you know another reason why one wouldn't want to underestimate this guy, or it helps to explain how he got as far as he did. Let's put it that way. And he did it because President Putin didn't allow the Russian official media to create the image of a popular general. Listen, Russian media has been developing many characters which does not need to exist, but the fear of the Zhukov effect, the fear that you can basically end up with a popular general which tomorrow can be an alternative to the president, created a situation in which the only kind of people that were really heroic were either dead or were privates. And as a result of it, basically, Prigozhin, who made himself a popular hero, entered into an image that Russians have been waiting for. Who is the popular military leader? A and this is a funny story. In a certain way, he was created twice by Putin, but sorry, we went, Mr. Prigozhin should give us a part of the honorarium. Yes, we, we, we ought to the on, cool. we could we could <laughs> speak about this incident all evening, but I want to sp spread it out a bit. Um, the first question that I think asks itself in the light of the events in the last two, three days or so is what sort of effect will this have on the battlefield and how is it being interpreted both in Ukraine uh, but also amongst uh, the Russian armed forces in Ukraine. Uh, I'm wondering whether it's had an unsettling effect, whether we've got any information through telegram channels or whatever that suggests that this has further undermined the already shaky morale of the Russian armed forces. Tim, do you want to start uh, either on Ukraine or on, or on the Russian military? Yeah, I mean, I, I, he I hesitate to speak about either because the, the Ukrainians can speak for themselves and the Russian situation seems to me to be very unclear, but I mean, all in all, it's, it's obviously good for Ukraine. Just how good for Ukraine remains to be seen. But I, for one, don't see 
how you magically resolve this post-coup situation back into an integrated Russian armed force. So what we understand of, the, of this deal includes the provision that the Wagner soldiers will now enter the Russian armed forces as contract soldiers, which strikes me as in it's like it's a, it's, a, it's a nice sort of Kremlin sentence, but it strikes me as incredibly implausible um, on a number of levels. I mean, first of all, these guys are used to being respected much more than Russian contract soldiers are. Secondly, they're used to being paid you know, a, at all and in cash and on time, right? Which is not the experience of Russian contract soldiers. And third, they're a different kind of fighting force. You know, you would not expect uh, American special forces to say like, oh, tomorrow you're just gonna be, you know, a regular grunt, right? You would not, that's, so, and that kind of thing matters. So I, I have trouble seeing that aside and apart from the fact that Wagner just took part in the attempted coup d'etat, which was headed off at the last moment, right? So you're now going to take these guys who were, were just about to take Moscow, and in my view, probably could have done so in some form, and you're going to send them back to Ukraine and, and, and uh, say, no, actually, it's a different capital. It wasn't that northern one. It's the southern one that you should be aiming for, right? Just turn it around, guys. It doesn't, like that, it, it, it seems to me also that the people in Wagner from what I can read now from the Telegram channels, and, and, and Yvonne will say more, but it seems like they are quite divided about how to understand what's going on. And the notion that they can just kind of be redirected, like Prigozhin got them to do one thing and now the Kremlin will get them to do another thing, that strikes me as not very plausible. And then the Russian armed forces themselves, I mean, I saw some of the propaganda that they were sent, and they, it was, it was a like, very Soviet thing about how like, the, Vog the Wagner soldiers were misled, they didn't know what they were doing, so if you see them, don't start a conflict with them. It strikes me that that would be more confusing than, any, than anything else. So I think it's not going to be good, but we're gonna have to, we'll, we'll see how it's not going to be good in the weeks to come. But I want to hear what Ivan has to say. No, no, I have not much to say because I should confess I don't have social media. So from this point of view, uh, the things came to come to me much later than to anybody else. Uh, but one of the things that I find quite important is every type of a coup like this starts with the idea of conspiracy but ends in paranoia. Listen, the question, what different people have been doing during these 24 hours is going to be the questions that they're going to ask each other in the elite. Uh, the purges, who did what and so on. So this is the atmosphere which is very much based on mistrust. And by the way, one of the reasons it's not so easy to organize a coup in a system like Russia is that in order to organize a coup, people should trust each other. And this is not so easy. system was not based on trust. But on the Western side, we also can make one mistake. The most difficult, in my view, is the regimes like Russia is to distinguish decay from collapse. We are seeing a decaying regime. There is no doubt on this. But the regimes can decay for a longer time. Uh, in a certain way, collapse is a momentum. Collapse happens. This is not structurally divided. There is a triggering thing. Something should happen, and then these all vulnerabilities of the regime are coming up. And this was why it was so interesting about Prigozhin, because everybody knew that this is a decaying regime and is asking the question, could be this the triggering moment? Uh, to be honest, uh, on the second hour, it was clear that it is not, because in order to be this moment, either the people should be on the street or it should be divided. And none of this happened. But from this point of view, how are you analyzing a decaying regime, which at the same time does not need to collapse tomorrow, is going to be the major story. And this is why what is happening on the battlefield is going to be critically important. And this is going to be critically important exactly for the fact that now every military defeat, even losing a village, even losing two villages, are going to be perceived from Prigozhin's major point. We are losing. We are lying to the people. They are lying to the president. We are losing. And this story of a propaganda based on we are winning and a guy is based on we are losing, in my view, this is the major story. But I don't have any information what is happening, really how the troops feel and what they are doing. and. I'm sh I was in Kiev yesterday. The only thing that I can tell you that Ukrainians were not unhappy of what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, what that, what that means, uh, Tim, is that the counteroffensive 
and its outcome in a way becomes even more important in as much that if you could get uh, a really significant breakthrough, then you're increasing the chances of a morale collapse in the Russian armed forces because they must to a degree be confused by all of these events even if, as you've both described, uh, it hasn't actually resulted in uh, a collapse. It's merely another, another stage of the decay. It's, um, I agree with Ivan that one has to be cautious in the sense that one might have thought that Russian soldiers would have seen the senselessness of this at many previous points. And for my money anyway, the idea that Russia is winning this war is one that has not seemed plausible for over a year. And yet, and yet, and yet, um, people manage to somehow hang on to the idea that Russia is winning. And I think this is, so to speak, sincere. I mean, when I see Russian propagandists work hard on the notion that because they've just, quote unquote, liberated a used car dealership that used to exist in the Bakhmut suburbs that they are winning. You know, th I, I think in some sense they have to believe that they're winning. I think they have a very hard time with, I mean, I'm saying an obvious thing, you know, for anyone who knows about Russians and Ukrainians, but I think the Russians have a very hard time imagining the sentence we are losing to Ukrainians, you know, in anything, right? I mean, from, you know, literature to, you know, the, the pole vault. Um, you know, not to mention a war, I think it's a very hard mental construct for Russians to have. Um, harder even than for Americans to imagine that they've lost wars. I mean, that's, it's a sort of imperialist generality that you don't know you've lost a war, right? I mean, my country is quite good at it. We, we still, there are a number of wars which we've lost, which we still have not recognized that we've lost, even though it's been 50 years, you know. And, but with Russia and Ukraine, this is, this is, this is, very, this is very specific. So I, I don't wanna be too sure about how the Russian soldiers are going to react because it seems like the notion that we're fighting a war, there's an enemy, <laughs> we should fight the enemy, has had more legs, more durability than one might have expected. Like that very simple idea that there's an enemy, which even Prigozhin, I mean, he kind of embodies. Like he, even as he says, this war is senseless. He nevertheless is quite good at telling the story of how it's an enemy and therefore we should be fighting the enemy and that was my duty. That's part of his story that I did my duty even though it was in some sense mis misconceived. That said, I want to, I want to agree with, with Ivan that um, a big Ukrainian breakthrough is gonna be hard to process for the narrative regime, which is Putin's regime. And Putin's regime, in my view, is you know, essentially narrative, and the and it's been able to handle a lot of weirdness over the past twenty years by changing the subject. I think Putin's you know Putin's superpower, in my view, as a as a as a leader, is to change the subject, not so much to always win, but to change the subject when he loses. So in two thousand fourteen, as people don't tend to remember, Russia actually failed to achieve most of its goals in Ukraine. It achieved some of them, but they were expecting the regime to fall. They were expecting that six oblasts were going to go their way, and it wasn't even close. They didn't come very didn't come close to achieving their own goals in 2014, and so in, on September 28th or 29th, 2015, they changed the subject to Syria, um, and then they were heroes in Syria for a while, and then they changed the subject back to Ukraine, and then they were heroes in Syria in Ukraine for a while. Putin is in a way doing the same thing with his coup. He's trying to change the subject, but it's not clear to what. Positively, he can change the subject. And if, the, if, this, if, there's a st if there is a fact which becomes too big for this narrative apparatus, and that, would, that fact, I think, would be a big Ukrainian breakthrough, mm -hmm. I think then they have problems in, in the real world. What does that mean for the counteroffensive? I don't think it means that Ukrainians should now throw all of their limited supplies of, of men and women at, at the line. I think they're doing the right thing by, by hanging back and trying to destroy logistics. And I think you know, the, the people who want this war to end have to accept that these two things go together. The war ends when pressure is felt inside Russia. 
this the the the, the, the Prigozhin run on Moscow, I think, in retrospect, will be seen as the first but not the last sign that pressure is being felt inside Russia. Those of us who want the war to end have to accept that there's no way for it to end except for more pressure to be felt inside Russia, which means the counteroffensive, this one or the next one, has to succeed. Ivan. I, I very much want to, uh, to develop the idea of how you are hiding a loss. And listen, this already happened. Uh, when President Putin said that what he started in Ukraine was a special operation, he told the truth. It was meant to be a special operation. It wants to be local, it wants to be short. It was going to end up with a pro-Russian government in Kiev, or at least with basically control of certain territories. Uh, but this ended already uh, last summer. So in a certain way, what is changing is you're changing the war. Putin is not fighting in Ukraine anymore. Because in a certain way, you cannot win. Because if the win is to prove that Ukrainians are Russians, this is over. So what he's fighting for, he's fighting to show that he's in a different war. He's in the war with the West, and the West is going to lose. So in a certain way, if before he went for local conflict, and he was very careful uh, not to act outside of Ukraine. By the way, he was very self-restrained in the beginning. By the way, he was very self-restrained in destroying infrastructure in the first weeks because he believed that he's going to use this infrastructure. This change, as we know, dramatically later. But as a result of it, his major story is, I don't want to be judged anymore what is happening on the battlefield. I want to be judged on what is happening in the idea of the international politics. Uh, we are not isolated. The United States hegemony is under question and so on. So from this point of view, this idea of changing the wars already happened. This time it's not Syria. It's not another local conflict. It is basically we're going on a higher level. And then the story is, let's see. And this is why uh, what changed during the, uh, the first and the second uh, year of the war, and here I do believe that Prigozhin really is important from the point of view of how Ukraine is experiencing the situation. In the first year of the war, any moment the Russians are not winning, they are losing. In the second year, exactly because it went on this fortification and everything went about the global politics, the expectation is that if Ukrainians are not winning, they are losing if you don't have a special counteroffensive, if you are not going to get new territory. And then the story of the Russians was, time works for us, we're going to wait. They fortified quite a lot. By the way, people from time to time cannot imagine the scale of the war. And I'm just going to give you three figures, because we talk about the wars all the time, but they're not the same war. 15 million U Ukrainians are not living now in the same place in which they were living in the first day of war. 15 million people, there is Indian colleague here, I'm not going to impress you, uh, but for anybody else, 15 million people <coughs> is a serious number. Secondly, the number of shells, artillery shells, that are fired now in Ukraine is on the level of 1943. This was the highest points of the basically World War II, this was. And thirdly, and for me this is very important, is the level of mining. Donbass, basically this region, after North-South Korean border, is the most mined place in the world. If the Ukrainians are going to demine on the pace that they are demining now, and they are demining only in the liberated territories, it's going to take them 700 years to do it. So I do believe keeping the scale is something critically important because every war is awful. And by the way, many people are killed. And Ethiopia, more people basically are killed than in Ukraine. But we're talking about the nuclear superpower in a war. And we're talking about the war which is on the level of World War I and World War II, on the level of forces, 1,000 kilometers uh, basically front. So. Uh, for me, at least, this type of a keeping the scale is critically important to understand what it means for Putin to say, listen, this is not the real issue. The real issue is the global confrontation with the West. And this is why I don't want to be judged on what is happening on the front. Judge me what is going to happen on the American elections. So uh, moving it out in that case, as you've done with explaining the, the Russian narrative, Tim, how do you see... How do you see the United States at the moment and its approach? I, its approach. What is Biden looking for uh, in terms of American policy towards Ukraine? Uh, 
towards the European Union and indeed towards Russia. Do you think there is a, a coherent counter-narrative here coming out of Washington? I think a number of really interesting things are, are going on. First, I want to take the opportunity to say that I think that Biden has been a historically good president, just because I think that doesn't get said enough. I think his, his, his backers tend to be ashamed to say that he's done good things and his critics are numerous and articulate. I think he's been a historically good president in domestic politics and in foreign policy. I think he's been head and shoulders above pretty much any other plausible alternative that we might have had during, during these years. I've chiefly been a critic of this administration in foreign affairs because I think we should have seen through a lot of the Russian bluster a lot more quickly. And we could have, you know, the, the things that we did this year, if we'd done them last year, we could have already ended this war and we wouldn't be having this discussion. So I've chiefly been a critic, but I wanna say that I think the Biden administration has done a better job than pretty much anybody else I could imagine in this role, um, by which I include not just Trump and the Trumpoids, but, but also people on the other side of the political spectrum. Um, I think the way that Biden has handled this has been of, of a, 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 a level or two or three superior to the way that, for example, <coughs> Barack Obama looked at a similar problem um, a decade a decade earlier. I just want that before we get into what's going to happen. I just wanted to get that out there because I don't think the American administration, at least in its own country, gets any sort of credit for the way that they've handled this this war. Not nearly not nearly <coughs> enough. So I think Putin's view is entirely coherent and correct at a level. So uh, to, to repeat what I said before, and it's just Clausewitz, oh, you, you win a war when the other side's political system bends under the pressure or breaks under the pressure. Fundamentally, that's what it's about. It's not fundamentally about territory or losses. It's fundamentally about breaking the other person's political system or at least bending it enough that it has to yield. That's when the war is over. And if you conceptualize the war, as Yvonne, I think, quite rightly says, as a war now against n NATO or the West, then the political system, which has to bend or break, again, from a Russian point of view, is the American one. Because they, you know, they, they, they overstate our importance, they understate the importance of the Europeans, and they think if Biden, you know, if Biden loses in 2024 and Trump wins, that's the American political system breaking. And in a narrow sense, I think that's quite accurate. I think the American political system will break. And we should keep in mind, and I think it get, doesn't get mentioned quite enough, that in 2016, the Russians were playing this game of trying to break the American political system with an extraordinary degree of success, um, which people, for various reasons, you know, partisanship, shame, I'm not sure, you know, American, American exceptionalism, have trouble recognizing now. And so, you know, we are now looking at a system where, of course, Putin is going to pull out all the stops to try to repeat 2016 and 2024 and get Trump elected. Um, because Trump, but not only Trump, um, also, you know, one of his rivals, DeSantis, they are throwing Putin a lifeline, essentially, by saying, if you elect us, we'll let you win, or in Trump's case, we'll help you win. Um, and that, I think materially affects the war because it makes the logic that Ivan is describing more plausible. Like if, if the Republican candidates just didn't say anything or if, you know, like, like a couple of them, if they said, no, no, we're going to continue to support Ukraine, that would make it easier for Putin to do something else besides prolong the war. So th trying to break the American political system makes perfect sense and that's what they're after. You know, ironic footnote, Probably the most successful participant in the Russian operation in 2016 was precisely Yevgeny Prigozhin, who, among his many career achievements, was the, the founder of the Internet Research Agency, which succeeded in driving a lot of votes away from Clinton, and which also succeeded in framing the questions at two out of the three American presidential debates. Again, we don't like to remember that because we're Americans and we really don't like other countries to have agency. And we especially don't like the idea that other countries have agency inside our political system. We have a lot of trouble with processing that, right? But it, but it, but it, is, it is kind of ironically the case. It's been interesting to watch the Russians lose their best propagandists. Um, you know, Sorkov, who was their best propagandist the last time they invaded Ukraine is no longer in the picture and I think they miss him. The next time they intervene in American elections, Prigozhin is 
I'm guessing not going to be in the picture, and I think he might he might also be missed. By the way, I don't know how many of you caught this, but when you know during this coup attempt, he actually referred to how he was intervening. <laughs> he he said uh, that when in St. Petersburg the FSB raided the, the raided Wagner's offices. They drove away one or two, or I forget how many vans full of cash. And Prigozhin said, yes, of course, we have lots of cash. We always pay in cash. You know, everything we've done, we've paid in cash. When we nightmared, which sounds like an American 23 year old talking, but it's actually, you know, it's something you can say in Russian. When we nightmared the American elections in 2016, we paid in cash, right? So he, he's even talking about this, like while he's carrying out this coup in Russia, he has time to talk about how he also tried to carry out a coup in the, Uni in the United States. So anyway, I mean, I think the, what, what Biden, the two important things for me are that Biden has to now win this war to win the American presidential election. And I think he understands that, which they didn't understand a few months ago. I think they've, they've gotten that. Um, and the second thing which is really important, and I'm, I, I think Yvonne will have much more to say about this, is that the Europeans now see helping Ukraine as a way, whereas at the beginning of the war, the Europeans, I mean, again, I'm speaking very generally, I apologize, but at the beginning of the war, you were different from the Americans by doing less. And now the idea is present that you can put space between yourself and the Americans by doing more for Ukraine, right? That is something new, or to be slightly less imprecise about it, I think both Schultz and Macron, with their very different ideas of the European future, have understood that you're not gonna get out from under the Americans without the Ukrainians. And that the Zelensky and Ukraine, whatever your scheme of the future of Europe is, Zelensky and Ukraine are going to be part of that scheme. And that strikes me as an important change. And it makes the American picture slightly less hopeless than it might seem, because what the Europeans are doing from Ukraine slowly, slowly, slowly is approaching what the Americans are doing for Ukraine. And unlike the Americans who like, because we're American, like every, you know, every four weeks we say, hey, like here's a big number. Oh, and by the way, we miscounted by $6 billion. We're not that good at math. This happens even in Austria when they yeah. count votes. <laughs> right. Whereas the, the Germans being the Germans actually, forgive me, but they actually now seem to have a plan. I mean, having done nothing for a while, they now actually have budget lines and three-year you know, three allocations and things which are basically unthinkable for us, right? And that's an interesting shift, but I want to hear what Ivan has to say about these Yes, Ivan, pa uh, pause the European response uh, uh, a bit, will you? Uh, I, I will, and for me, in order to understand basically how the European uh, position develops, and when you say European, of course, we're generalizing to the level of uh, 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 stupidity, but in my view, the first question that I was trying to ask myself was why Europeans we were so reluctant to believe that the war was possible. And listen, it's not about the intelligence. To be honest, the Americans were sharing the intelligence more than ever before. And many people, particularly in Eastern Europe, in our part of the world, were saying this was because of the naivete uh, about Russia. I even don't buy this very much, honestly speaking. I do believe we're touching on something much more profound. For the Europeans to believe that the major war in which Russia is going to attack Kiev, by the way, major European city, also having, after in 1994, being the guarantor for territorial integrity of Russia, of, uh, of Ukraine, it means that basically the three major assumptions on which European security doctrine is based have been fundamentally challenged. First is the idea of economic interdependence being the major source of security. Listen, people like to say that, oh, this was simply the commercial interest that were pushing uh, Chancellor Merkel to go for uh, Nord Stream 2. And after 2015, in my view, this was uh, uh, true. But basically, at the end of the day, all European security, not simply German, was based on the idea that we're going to trade so actively with you that you're never going to have an incentive to start a war against us. And this is what Germans did with respect to France, and this is what done in the case of Eastern Europe, and it didn't work in the case of Russia, because European understanding of international politics was totally focused on the economy. Listen, when we are saying before the war that President Putin and the Russian regime are very corrupt, 
this was reassuring. <laughs> because if you're corrupt, it means that the money are the most important things and you're not going to do anything that is going basically to hurt your bank account. The idea that probably it's not only about this uh, was a problem. But the second problem was after 2003, after Americans not so splendid uh, war in Iraq, uh, Europeans basically decided that in 21st century, military power has lost part of its purchase power. Investing in defense was perceived as wasted money. Uh, and it looked, but this was rational. I'm saying because all these assumptions were not idiotic assumptions. They were boys based on a relevant experience. But based on this relevant experience, when the war started, it turned out that Ukraine has artillery shells for six weeks and Germany for two days. One of the reasons basically Europeans were not giving in the beginning enough weapons to the Ukrainians was also that they didn't have it. So much peace was taken for granted in Europe that to imagine that Russians can attack, it means that you should totally change your idea of what Europe is about. And the third is, if this war was possible, all the idea of the European uh, sovereignty, which is so close particularly to President Macron, was going to be very much challenged because when the war started, the security dependence of Europeans on the United States became as clear as in the days of the Cold War. And in my view, because of unwillingness to see all this, it was very difficult to believe that the war is possible. The second thing that's surprising was is why Europeans and here Americans were not different. It was so difficult, but for Europeans, I'm going to say, because for me it's much more interesting from the European point of view, it was so difficult to imagine that Ukrainians are going to have a will, but also the capacity uh, to resist. And listen, even to be honest, the American intelligence, which was very uh, fine when it comes to the Russian intentions, basically were betting about six weeks. And all the talk was about the guerrilla war. And one of the reasons Americans in before the war did not give advanced weapons to the Ukrainians was that they feared that they're going to be captured by the Russians. Uh, I'm saying this because one of the reasons why Ukraine was viewed like this is something that is discussed very much, that part of the view of Ukraine was very much shaped by Russia itself. We are seeing very much Ukraine in the way the Russians are seeing it. And by the way, the public opinion polls that you are reading even before the war was telling to believe that basically Russians had a point. Secondly, because Europeans, we were totally obsessed with institutions. So when you go and you're trying totally to see what is the absorption capacity of this and that and how you're responding, but the certain, this is for me fundamental reason is, for Europeans it was very difficult to acknowledge the transformative powers of defensive nationalism. Because don't forget, in the previous war, in the Yugoslav war, European identity was defined strictly as anti-national. And in this war, you should try to reconcile Europe as a post-national society in which following Brecht we believe that we feel sorry for nations that need heroes. And on the other side, the fact that it was basically the willingness of the Ukrainians to defend their lands and their sovereignty that allowed them to stand and basically losing a lot of people. So the paradoxical reconciliation of this was that Europeans became Ukrainian nationalists. And I'm saying it very positively. I'm going to tell you how it happened during the Maidan you have European flags in Kiev. During this war, you have the Ukrainian flags in Europe. Uh, this was kind of the way that you're identifying because at the same time, it was a European moment, but also a sovereignist moment. Uh, and I'm, I'm not using this nationalism, to be honest, in a negative term, but I do believe this is extremely important to understand what was the intellectual challenge for Europe. And my third point on this is, for the Europeans, it was also very difficult to understand why the rest of the world did not react in the way uh, Europeans and Americans reacted. And by the way, to be just being Bulgarian, I should be slightly much more honest, European, on the level of public, the European reaction is not as unified and as solid as normally people talk. Uh, Bulgaria contributed quite a lot, if you're going to see on the arms issues, one third of all Soviet uh, uh, standard shells in Ukraine were coming from the Bulgarian uh, military industrial complex, but at the same time, 65% of the population is against uh, basically supporting uh, uh, because of fear of the war. And one of the interesting stories that you see when you see the public opinion maps, not what the governments do, is 
old imperial maps are back. Countries like Poland and the Baltic Republics that have been part of the Russian Empire, not the Soviet Union, were supporting basically Ukraine in the way it's about them. Countries that have been part of the Ottoman Empire, Serbs, Bulgarians, Greeks, opinion polls on a different place. Habsburgs, like always, are in between uh, with a difference. <laughs> I'm saying this because this shows is something very important. This war triggered some of the long histories in the regions because it brought back the disintegration of the old continental empires, the Ottoman, the Habsburg, uh, the Russian Empire. And also what became clear is that Europeans, we can have common dreams, but our nightmares are strictly national. Uh, when you go on the opinion polls, you're going to see that from the day one, polls and the both said that what they really fear is occupation. Germans and French nuclear war. Uh, and I do believe this kind of experience, and by the way, the disappearance of the communist period, the Cold War period, became very critical. But exactly because of this happening, we didn't realize not simply why the governments of India or South Africa or Brazil and others do not share the view, but even the public opinion was not sharing the view. Uh, I was part of a team that was doing uh, uh, with the European Council of Foreign Relations a survey uh, in China, uh, India, uh, Turkey, and you're going to be surprised to see that basically public opinion was where the government's wars. It was not that they were supporting Russia, but Indians are going to say that 64% of them perceives Russia as an ally with whom they share values and interests, and 65% that they also perceive the United States as an ally. So from this point of view, suddenly for them it was not their war. They didn't want basically to identify. And they didn't want to identify, and this is my last point, because one of the interesting stories that happened is that the Cold War narrative for the first time was totally replaced by the decolonization narrative. And then we realized that the Cold War was the peak of the Western influence, because during the Cold War, both fighting parties has their kind of a roots in the European Enlightenment, and the problem was who is the legitimate and who is the illegitimate son. Well, suddenly, countries like India, China is a much more complex case, but also very important, and Turkey, they see this as an opportunity. Not simply economic opportunity. What we are seeing in the world is the rise of the middle powers, which basically are very much activists. They try to be relevant. They don't want to take sides. And which basically are competing with other for relevance, but also for identity. And I'm saying this because one of the interesting stories in the European case was that we don't understand that they are alienated from Ukraine, not because of the Ukrainians, but because they basically think much more the countries that support Ukraine, the United States. Uh, the, the European former colonial powers. And here's the paradox of East Europeans. We were so Eurocentric that we missed the moment to tell our story. Who was the biggest reporter of decolonization period? It was a poll. It was Kapuczynski. And when he was going to this part of the world, he was always to Africa or Latin America, was making one point. I understand what is happening here because I was colonized myself. This kind of a story of East Europeans and Ukrainians not talking on behalf of their experience, but allowing the Americans and the West Europeans to advocate for them in front of the Brazilians, Indians, uh, and others, didn't end up well. And as a result of it, basically, you have a situation which, in my view, for the last two or three months, for the first time, you can see that the Ukrainians decided that their only chance is to talk to these countries on their own, basically trying to say, listen, we try to, probably you're going to understand what is happening to us because you are going to see certain things that was happening to you in your own history. Uh, Tim, I'm conscious of the time, so, uh, and Ivan has set this up to an extent. Uh, before we go for a quick round of questions, uh, Ivan mentioned India, but we briefly touched now and then on China. Where does, where does, the Russo-Ukrainian war stand in that complex relationship US-China, China-Russia, and China-EU? Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the imperial framework which Ivan just introduced is very important to help us sort out some things that are happening, and I want to just spend a moment on that before I, before I get to China. I think it, it speaks really directly to an issue of the issue of who is the victim. One of the problems that Ivan mentioned the French and the Germans, but it's true of the Americans too, is that we have trouble n 
seen somebody else besides ourselves as the victim. And that, that is a typical post-imperial pose that you, 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 you are always the victim. The Russians take this, I believe, to an extreme that they are the victims in the Russo-Ukrainian war um, and that we just don't understand that. But I think all post-imperial powers have that tendency. And, the, and, and uh, just bear with me for a minute. One of the ways this has taken shape is the notion that this is really about us because there might be a nuclear war. So when, when Putin has spent you know, these last 15 months with all this nuclear bluster, it is a way of telling the French, the Germans, and the Americans that oh, the war is not really about the Ukrainians, it's really about you. And not just that you should be afraid, but you should be thinking about yourselves. And if you think about yourself only in a typical post-imperial way, then of course you're not gonna be thinking about the Ukrainians, you're gonna be thinking about how to stop the war and so on. I think this is a very conscious strategy. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is that it bears directly on what just happened. So this whole story, which I think has been quite wrong-headed about how, well, we can't push Putin into a corner because nuclear war. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why I think that's nonsense, but we've just seen what happens when Putin is pushed into a corner. We just saw it. He runs, he runs away and he writes a check. We have now seen it. Now we know. And we shouldn't overlook that, especially because the peril that Putin was just in, in Russia, is categorically greater than any peril on the Ukrainian battlefield. There is no Ukrainian territory which is more important than the Kremlin. So we have now just seen what Putin does. Gets on a plane, writes a check, changes the story. Now we know. So we don't have any excuse to talk about how this war might be about us because maybe nuclear war. We no longer have that excuse. The imperial, the imperial issue here runs really deep with respect to the Europeans in a specific way. And that is that the, there's, and this bears on Ivan's analysis of what went wrong. I think there's a fundamental confusion between peace and victory. The European self-account of what happened after 1945 is there was peace. <laughs> there was a war, the war was in Europe, it was bad, but at the end of it there was peace, and peace was good. And lo and behold, we um, Europeans were wise enough to recognize that peace was good. That's the story, and it's of course nonsense. After 1945, all, basically all the major European powers kept fighting wars until they lost them, which is the normal historical pattern. It's just that they were imperial wars beyond Europe and therefore could be nicely excluded from the nice European integration story, right? Indonesia and Indochina and, and, and Algeria and the Belgian Congo and Spanish and Portuguese Africa, they can all be nicely excluded and are excluded from the European story. And that allows the Europeans to tell the story about peace. And they apply the idea of peace to the Second World War. But what happened to the Germans at the end of the Second World War was not peace. We didn't peace them. We defeated them. You and so the application of this notion that we're going to peace Russia, right? It was the wrong way of looking at things. In the, the, the normal, and this applies to my country too, the normal pattern is that you fight imperial wars until you lose. And so the entire European project is self-misunderstood as a project of peacing people, when in fact the European project is what happens after you lose w imperial wars. And so it follows that what you have to do with Russia is watch it lose and help it lose, not peace it, <laughs> but, but help it lose. Like the vic and therefore, victory should be, in a more self-aware European narrative of what's going on, victory should be the central concept or defeat of empire should be the central concept. Okay, which brings me, which brings me to, the, to the world we're in and, and to China. Um, and I'm sure others are gonna have more to say about this, but it's, it's my, my, my view of this is a very, is a very simple one. It's, it's, it's what I've been saying since the war started, that there are a lot of reasons to hope that Ukrainian resistance is successful. And one of them is that it can head off the supposedly inevitable American-Chinese confrontation. So if you accept the logic 
that you know we, there has to be an American Chinese confrontation because they're rising and we're falling and so on. Which, by the way, I don't I don't think they're rising. I don't think we're falling. But if you accept that logic, then there are a few really dangerous years right now. But what if Ukrainian resistance teaches the lesson that it's not a good idea to carry out a, you know complicated offensive operations? Which I believe is the case. I believe that is the lesson that has been learned thus far. If you let the Russians win, though, then you're denying Beijing the chance to learn that lesson. So for, there's there's more to say about this, but I'm going to let Ivan Ivan say it. For me, that's the elemental thing. We want to avoid this confrontation between Washington and Beijing. The way to avoid it is for China not to make a move in the South China Sea. The way to make that less likely is to make sure that Ukraine can win this war. And just one point, which in my view is very important, and this is exactly how empires are defeated, and particularly nuclear empires. Because one of the interesting story about uh, uh, our narrative about the war is that we were insisting on two things at the same time and they cannot be true at the same time. That Putin is insane and that he's never going to use nuclear weapon. I do believe both of them can be true, but they cannot be put easily together. The problem with the nuclear empires like France or the United States and so on is they're not losing in the way Germany is losing. They're losing because basically they understand the limits of the empire. They certainly understand Algeria was, listen, Algeria was big. And United States was quite a lot of people in Vietnam before. Nevertheless, it's slightly more complicated story. I don't believe that. The, why I'm saying this, the biggest problem is how to define victory. And defining victory, first of all, obviously going with uh, Putin in the regime is one. But then the victory itself, and I very much agree with your distinctions between peace and victory. Listen, the absence of war is not peace. And Michael Howard, the best known military historians, he has this famous sentence in which he said, war is ancient as the world, but peace is a modern invention. Uh, peace is not simply the absence of war. Peace is a t certain type of a settlement in which both sides have an incentive not to do it. Uh, I'm saying this because for me, the most important now for Europe is to try to imagine how this kind of a post-war, not Ukraine, but post-war Europe is going to look like, and see the major change of positions. Two years ago, uh, Henry Kissinger, being coming from a very realist school, was one of the persons who was strongly against uh, Ukraine joining NATO. Now Henry Kissinger is one of the major advocates with a classical realist uh, argument. He said, Ukraine became too powerful to be kept outside. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is extremely important argument when you talk about European uh, security structure. You cannot have a country with such a strong army which is not integrated because then your relations are going to be what? Like an empire and border people from the 15th, 16th century. This is a recipe for a conflict. French President Macron, not the most enthusiastic uh, supporter of Ukraine in the beginning. Suddenly, he's now strongly pushing for Ukraine joining uh, NATO, uh, saying, only defeat of Russia, only non-threatening Russia can basically guarantee that European Union can have policy autonomous from the United States. But the problem with lessons, and here, uh, this is a great conversation. The problem with lessons is that you never know what kind of lessons you're learning. Are the Chinese learning the lessons? Don't start a stupid war. Or are they learning the lessons? Don't start it too late. Because one of the things that basically President Putin probably is asking himself that if he wanted to have this operation, better to have it in 2014, when Yanukovych was still around and the Ukrainian army was doing nothing. In a certain way, the fear that Taiwan is going to develop defense capabilities, which basically Ukraine managed to develop for the years between 2014 and 2022, and where I do believe uh, we Europeans were kind of left late to notice. And here's somebody, by the way, should really credit the Brits for what they did, particularly on training the middle-level commanders of the Ukrainian army. So the most interesting story is that we're living in such a vulnerable world in which you know that everybody is going to learn the lesson. The only thing that you know true is which of the lessons they're going to learn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan. I'm going to, uh, we're, we're very constrained by time, I'm afraid. So I'm going to allow two questions, as I'm sure the answers to those two questions will take us well over time. Uh, I see Kim first, and then this uh, 
Yeah, hi, Kim Shepley, Princeton, and welcome back, Tim. This is great to see you. Um, so I have a question about the sort of uh, gorilla on the stage that hasn't been really discussed, and that is Russia after Ukraine wins. Um, and the, one of the only thing that might be worse for Ukraine than what's happening to it now is a Russia that is completely chaotic and has no one in charge of it after the war. So I'm wondering how you see the end of this conflict when Russia is defeated, um, given that there is no logical succession, given that the narratives don't have any room for any defeat, um, and it would be pretty chaotic to have uh, defeated Russia. So how do you fix that problem? And I'm going to take the second question straight away so that the two of you can answer both questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, being a fan of your work, if not even a groupie, it felt like being a groupie and waiting outside in the queue to get in. Uh, I have a personal question also because that concerns myself. Being an academic working with international law, is there a line between somewhat like a political activist, and I know that you're routinely accused of activism, in particular when it comes to your takes on the possibility of a nuclear war, on the one hand, and on the other hand, being an academic. Is there such a line? And if there is such a dividing line, where is it? Thank you. Ivan, why don't you start with the Russia after Ukraine? I'm going to leave. This is uh, uh, to Tim to say where is the line, probably somewhere in Donbass. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'll start with this uh, uh, really important question. And there is one thing in which, in my view, the Ukrainians are absolutely legitimate to criticize the West for the last 30 years, and that there was never a Ukrainian policy of the West. Ukraine was always part of the Russia policy, in two totally different versions, by the way. One was not to appease Russia, the other is let's destabilize Russia, basically let's move the Orange Revolution to Moscow, but all the time the policy towards Ukraine was based on the fact that we're doing something in Ukraine in order to affect something that is going to happen in Russia. And now I don't believe how this post-war Russia is going to look like. And one of the things that in my view is very important and, uh, is to try to understand the limits of the Western policy and agency. From time to time, uh, the West talks as if everything depends on what the West is going to do. But uh, a senior uh, uh, official in this administration, Phil Gordon, who was in charge of the Middle East, once in my view formulated something that I found uh, very important. He said, in Iraq, we intervene and we occupied, and it didn't work. In Syria, we didn't intervene and, it and we did not occupy and it didn't work. In Libya, we intervene and we did not occupy, and it didn't work. So from this point of view, the West is not the only agent of global politics. I don't believe that the West is going to settle Russia. At the end of the day, it's going to be very much Russians. I do believe it's going to be messy, and it's going to be messy in the way probably we cannot imagine. Side exactly, side effects. But to believe that we can predict this, and to behave as if based on this prediction, in my view, is simply going to be wrong. Uh, so from this point of view, you should have a Ukrainian policy based on the fact that we don't know what is going to happen in Russia. Uh, so basically going and saying, listen, this is a big country. There is a lot of people, by the way, very different people living there. They have their own ideas what is going to happen in their own country. So from this point of view, one of the important things is that you have the agency, and first we saw the Ukrainian agency during this war, but this is very important also to know the limits of the Western ambition and capacity. Because the idea that basically the West is remodeling the world and reshaping this and so on, first this has happened before. The results were not particularly admirable. Uh, but secondly, we don't have the capacity to do it. Uh, and as a result of it, in my view, knowing the limits is critically important for any type of responsible policy. Uh, knowing what you cannot do from time to time is more useful to people that you want to help than pretending that you can do everything that you want. Yeah. So, um, there, you know, o often I realize that I'm not as good a person as Yvonne. So, you know, <laughs> Yvonne, Yvonne doesn't read social media, and I only don't read social media about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the proposition that you're putting to me about the nuclear stuff is completely new to me, and baffling because a lot of people talk about nuclear war and it does happen to be one of the things which I studied. 
So in, before I became a historian of Eastern Europe, what I worked on, what I was studying to become was an arms negotiator. And I spent a great deal of time and work writing about nuclear deterrence and, and, and how it works. And so the things that I've said about nuclear war during this conflict were meant to be reassuring on the basis of some kind of baseline experiences um, and theory about how nuclear deterrence works. And the things that I try to say, I'm trying to now bridge that and your general question, um, I try to add things from history which can be clarifying. So there's this image, for example, which was built up that, and people still say this all the time, although it's ridiculous, that nuclear powers can't lose wars because at the end of the day they'll always just drop a bomb, which is historically false. It's interesting to know that since the Second World War, the colonial power generally loses, the bigger power generally loses, and the <laughs> nuclear power also generally loses. Um, look at the United States of America. We lost war after war. Um, nuclear weapons didn't save the British Empire. They didn't save the French in Algeria. They didn't save the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So you know, the, I, these are meant to be calming remarks and not like, I'm not sure what kind of policy I'm advocating except not to panic and not to allow yourself to be blackmailed, right? Another thing I've tried to say about nuclear, about nuclear weapons is that nuclear proliferation is bad because it math whatever the other contingencies are, it increases mathematically the chances of a nuclear confrontation and that you, you, you make nuclear proliferation more likely if you give in to nuclear blackmail. So Russia has been trying to nuclear blackmail everyone. If you give in to it, if you say, oh yes, because you have nuclear weapons, you are in fact allowed to invade Ukraine, that is then a precedent for everyone else who has nuclear weapons, but it's also a reason to acquire nuclear weapons not just for the offense, but for the defense, right? So that for me is meant to be a calming remark. Like let's not, get, let's not freak out when people nuclear blackmail us. Let's realize that there is a safer course of action, which is not to be nuclear blackmailed. And I think, like, I think that's a pretty reasonable view. And like, I'm not really sure it's policy advocacy. Anyway, I, was, I'm, I didn't actually know that this was where I became controversial was on, was on nuclear war. I think people really like, I mean, for the reason I gave before, I think, think people actually really like nuclear war as a topic because, no, the same way people like horror movies, because it puts you at the center of an experience, which is imaginary, but it's all about you, right? It's not about Ukrainians, it's about you and about how you get, now you get to be afraid. You don't have to think about Zaporizhia and the dam. You don't have to think about the kidnapped children. You don't have to think about the raped men and the, ca and the castrated women. Sorry, the other way around, but not. But you know, you don't have to think about the castrated men and the raped women. You don't have to think about the fact that more than half the Ukrainian population has been displaced and a third of the Ukrainian population is currently displaced. You don't have to think about the, the execution of local elites. You can just think about this thing which is psychologically comfortable for you, which is, oh, there might be a nuclear war. And that, you know, that makes me in a, in a strange way comfortable because it's about, it's about me and, and, and it's not really gonna happen, right? So it makes the whole thing cinematic. That's what I've been, I mean, I've been trying to work against that because I don't think that's a good, that's a good environment for policy. So, you know, on the question, I mean, I try, to, I try to tell, I mean, what's consistent between being an academic and being a public intellectual is trying to tell the truth about things. And like that for me is the comfortable overlap, is like just saying the stuff which is, which I think is importantly true, like that you're, for example, one of my big academic preoccupations, which is in all of my books, it's in Bloodlands, it's in Black Earth, it's in Road to Unfreedom, is that post-1945 Europe is a post-imperial history more than anything else. And that informs what I say about policy, right? I, I, I think that's true and therefore I can say it when it's relevant, when it's relevant to, 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 to policy. Um, okay, and then on, on Kim's question, I mean, I think actually, so again, I'm going to do my calming thing. I think that, you know, Russia, the Putin, I'm going to say something incredibly controversial. Putin was not going to live forever anyway. By the way, it's a viable hypothesis. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is true that you now have a dead man in charge of a Russian political party. That is actually, no, you don't, so there's a, there's a, there's a, I'm going to let Yvonne explain that. This is much more Yvonne's territory than mine. But you do have a dead person in charge of a Russian political party. I do not think a dead person is going to be in charge of the Russian state. Um, the, so the Putin, Putin was going to die at some point. The Russia, his regime was going to fall at some point anyway. It was going to be a mess anyway. 
And the Ukrainian war has given us the opportunity to think about that. And it has deprived us of the excuse of saying, oh, we're very surprised, right? That's what it's done. It has given us the opportunity to ask Kim's question and to think, okay, what might we be able to do rather than just say, okay, we're very surprised. Because the default before the Ukraine war, forgive me for saying so, was that in fact Putin was going to live forever and that just, you know, and that Ru the Russian state was going to maintain itself indefinitely the way that it is. And that was never true. And now we're aware that it's not true. My short answer of what to do about it, agreeing with Yvonne, is that we at the United States of America and the European Union have demonstrated consistently that we are not able to demonstrate, we're not able to influence Russia. We're not. We have not been able to do the things we want to do inside Russia at any point. What we have been able to do, and this is the scale at which we can make a difference, is to influence things inside Ukraine. I think that the best Russian policy has always been a good Ukraine policy. And in this particular case, there are limits to what we can do with Russia. But the way we can affect Russia, I believe, is to help Ukraine succeed. I think that that is Putin's nightmare, that Ukraine succeeds, and it should be the, the dream of the Europeans. Because if Ukraine succeeds, that at least creates a chance of some kind of an example for the right kind of Russians. It may or may not work, but I think it's the closest thing that we have to a sound Russia policy, is a good Ukraine policy. Thank you, Tim. Well, with that cheery message that Vladimir Putin is indeed mortal, uh, I want you all to express your thanks for this extraordinary exchange between Tim Snyder and Ivan Krastev, which has been so impressive.